right, we are, are about to get started with our next session of the Acadia National Park Science Symposium. We'll just let folks uh, hop on here. It's just three o'clock right now. Thanks all for joining us on this, this almost snowy day, I think, or maybe, can we call it a snowy day? Let's call it a snowy day um, here. And this, this is being recorded. And uh, so please uh, remain uh, on mute unless you have a question during the question session. And the chat box is a great way to communicate as well and ask questions while we wait for folks to hop on. Um, maybe you can, in the chat box, let us know where you're uh, zooming in from and how much snow you have on the ground where you are. I wanna see who has the most snow and I wanna go there. Cleveland, no snow in Cleveland. All right, huh? New York, just a dusting. What, three inches at headquarters? Are you sure about that, Jesse? I'm not believing that. Nobody has snow. Oh, such a disappointing winter so far. Snow drifts, snow drifts don't count. <laughs> All right, yeah, not much snow. Ah, oh, it's gotta be coming soon, I hope. We shall see. All right, well, it looks like you know, people are slowly just jumping on as well, um, but we will we'll get started, started here. So welcome everybody uh, to this session uh, of the Acadia National Park Science Symposium. This is the early career opportunities. We started this a year ago, essentially, and got lots of good feedback on this. And so wanted to have this session again to share some of the opportunities that exist here in and around Acadia for um, especially summer positions, high school, college, post-college uh, positions here and among multiple organizations. So you're gonna hear from uh, Acadia National Park, National Park Service. You're gonna hear from Scudic Institute, Friends of Acadia, and also the national level, uh, national office of the National Park Service uh, as well. But you know, this is the science symposium. So before we get into that, I think, I think we should look at, um, we should look at some science, a scientific figure here, perhaps. All right, and, and just for those who had just hopped on, um, this is being recorded and uh, please stay on mute and you can use the chat to let us know where you're coming, calling in from and how much snow you have on the ground outside your window. All right, so, so yes, we are in the science symposium and uh, before we, we get into all of that, oh, I just lost my mouse here. Second. All right. So I, I thought I'd show a, a, a figure here, right? This is a, a good way to start things to warm up. So my specialty is, is climate change adaptation, helping park managers understand ongoing and future climate change, working through uh, the adaptation decision making cycle, developing research that informs stewardship and, and adaptation science. Um, and so you know, this figure is global surface temperature, historical on the left, and then future projections on the right, a few different scenarios. What I see here, aside from no label on the X for the X axis, uh, or uh, no legend for the X axis, is a whole lot of change is going to happen. And we know here today, we're already at the extreme warm edge of historical conditions and, and really getting into novel conditions. And the Earth's climate system, it's, it's like a gigantic cargo ship. It doesn't turn very fast. Uh, and so there's a lot of additional change baked into the system over the next several decades, uh, really regardless of, of emissions 
trajectory. And <laughs> and I swear this has to do with today's topic, uh, if you just stay with me. And so in my in my work, I'm fortunate to often get to work with with you know, senior leaders in in conservation, senior because they're in in higher positions within their organizations. Uh, in in many cases, often also senior in the sense that that perhaps they are are late career uh, folks. And and I'm navigating that one super carefully here since this is being recorded. I'm not calling anybody old, um, but just later in in career here. And I think my my point I think is that these senior managers have been navigating a bunch of change over recent decades. You can see that in in this figure, the change that's been been happening. Uh, and, and all you early career folks on the line here today, uh, you're going to be working under, under a lot of change in, in the coming decades as well. And um, there we go. Uh, you know, this will be the reality of, of your careers. Uh, be working under novel climatic conditions, the reality of the next several decades, really regardless of emissions trajectory. And uh, that's, that's the Debbie Downer piece, the, the challenges, uh, it's the truth, but there's also much hope and, and opportunity here as well. Opportunity to be better stewards, opportunity to be better scientists and educators and, and communicators and the conservation professionals. And, and so I, I know you're developing the skills to be able to directly address climate change and, and not just to, to not to, kick some of these challenges further down the road, but to work directly on mitigation and, and adaptation solutions. Uh, and you know, this is climate change here that I'm showing this figure. Could be a whole host of other factors here uh, on the y-axis, uh, in addition to global surface temperature. You know, lots of social and political changes are gonna happen. There are lots of other global changes. So point being that even if you're not gonna be a climate change adaptation specialist, although I think you should be, uh, you're going to be working with lots of change in your career and, and steering that change for a, a better future. And, and early career opportunities are one of the most important strategies for future success of conservation. And all the partners here that you'll hear from today that work together in and around Acadia uh, are, are recognize the importance of this and are developing transformative experiences that will be springboards uh, for, for your careers. You have a lot of important work to do and, uh, and we're glad that you're thinking about doing that with us. And, and so with that, I think we're gonna get right into the speakers that we have and then there will be a breakout session uh, after we hear from the speakers and then we'll all get together. Um, I'm gonna hand it over next to Jesse Wheeler, and then Catherine Schmidt will be moderating the, the rest of the session today. So thanks all for being here, and Jesse, take it away. Great, thanks, Nick, uh, for that introduction. And, and I think, I was just trying to think, I, I guess I have a, maybe a degree of optimism. That's why I suggested we had three inches of snow here when we clearly don't have three inches of snow. Um, I like snow we may have a future with not as much as I just probably got from your your uh, your figure right there. So anyhow, um, I work with resource management at Acadia National Park uh, biologists, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit, just briefly go over a few positions that we have um, through, uh, uh, through the Park Service uh, as kind of seasonal in nature. And it really is kind of going to be um, to where uh, we're, when I talk about seasonal in nature, it's kind of like a six month uh, period. Um, but then there are also some opportunities that are going to be in the uh, in kind of the realm of the uh, 13 weeks. Uh, so like a couple of few months, kind of a, more of a classic summer. So like like Nick mentioned, a lot of, a lot of these are kind of college uh, age or post postgraduate actually. Uh, so it could be getting into mid mid career a little bit. Um, can everybody see my screen right now? Good enough. All right. Uh, so, Jesse, yeah. So, yes. Jesse, we see your presenter view, so we can see your next slide and your. Okay. Notes. All right. Let me try this then.
Okay. How about, how about that, Catherine? Yes, that looks good. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, work with, in resource management and so some of the seasonal positions that we have are in cultural and natural resource management. Uh, the, kind of the work groups or the programs within that that we often have uh, shorter term employees, sometimes revisiting year after year um, and, and kind of coming back and, and providing continuity there. There's uh, air and water quality uh, resources, wildlife management, uh, invasive plant management. Uh, and then museum archives and curatorial. Uh, so these are the positions that we are, they're likely to be gonna be hiring some, some new uh, positions for 2022. Uh, most of these positions, again, kind of require a college degree. They're in the, what's called the general series or GS5 uh, or, or above uh, uh, level of, of employment. Uh, and so there may be some specialized experience that you might get within, you know, within your college kind of major program or even work experience that qualifies you for these positions. Uh, these are all advertised in USA Jobs. And for, for this work, <laughs> work group, they're, they're usually advertised between now or December and early uh, of next year. So uh, stay tuned next couple of months on USA Jobs. So the uh, spe specifically the positions that it, once you're in at USA Jobs and you look for are biological technician positions, both wildlife and plants. And so again, those have those kind of GS levels and that gets at what you qualify for. Uh, there's a museum technician and physical science technician. And so a little bit more about what those particular positions will do within resource management. Uh, the wildlife folks uh, primarily are working on a lot of bat conservation and bat research. Uh, as well as other wildlife issues. Uh, beavers might be another one. Uh, and then, so there's a lot of like kind of been in, in, ingrained with a lot of ongoing research that's happening at the park. Um, for the plants position, like I mentioned, a lot of that is working with the invasive plant management team, as well as doing some native plant restoration, uh, as well as some forest pest monitoring and, and management as well was within there. Uh, and the museum technician that's working here with our, our museum curator, uh, our, in our cultural resources wing. Uh, and then the physical science technician, which is doing the air quality and, and water quality. So the water resources at the park would be like our lakes and our streams and ponds. And then there's also uh, internship positions that are embedded within uh, certain work groups and divisions at the park. Uh, so one of these would be the Student Conservation Association, and there are several positions that the park is going to be uh, hiring for next year. Uh, those would be the Historic Carriage Roads crew, so that's within our maintenance division. Uh, Raptor Monitoring and Education, that's actually within our uh, Visitor Experience and Education uh, division, and as well as Invasive Species Management, so that was uh, the invasive plants, invasive uh, forest pests within resource management. And a little bit more detail about those positions that, that we'll, be, uh, we'll be looking to fill. Uh, up to four positions for the carriage roads crew. So that's the historic carriage roads where it'll be working on repairing historic masonry, stone walls, bridges, working on drainage, uh, like ditching, some vegetation management within the coping stones and the cultural landscape there that make up the, the carriage roads. And there might be some opportunity for some uh, in, interpretive work within those positions as well. They're typically uh, a June through September kind of a time frame, and during the summer, about 13 weeks long. Uh, the Raptor in intern uh, is assisting the Paragon Falcon Watch Ranger, uh, so that's during the spring and summer. Uh, working with the Hawk Watch program in the fall. So this is a little bit of a longer position. Uh, this one may be at the GS4 equivalent, uh, which, which means that you, you don't need to have a full bachelor's degree, for, for example, for to qualify, but um, also integrated with, with the rest of an interpretive division. So there may be some visitor inform center information desk duties uh, and also some professional development opportunities that are there with that, with that Ranger intern, or sorry, Raptor intern. Uh, and then finally, the, the invasive species uh, intern will be one position likely looking to, uh, that one works with, with me, uh, in, in probably in the fall of 2022. Uh, that would be a 13-week length program, kind of a September through December 
uh, working with invasive plant management team uh, in kind of the earlier part of the fall and then late part of the fall, uh, some monitoring and managing of forest pests. Uh, there'll be some native plant restoration work and monitoring and removal of non-native plants. Uh, I'll end in just one little extra tidbit, <laughs> another internship program, which is the American Conservation Experience, some folks might have heard of, is kind of similar to SCA. Uh, we've had success the last couple of years where our trail crew embedded within maintenance or historical trails uh, program has had a position there and they're likely to fill one next year as well. This would be one position during the summer, maybe a little bit longer of a 16 week, kind of May through September embedded with our trails crew. So working on wooden bridges and steps, stone uh, steps and walls, uh, a lot of the tread, you know, kind of drainage work as well, uh, water bars, things like that. So that's working with our, with our trail crew uh, there. And then so kind of how to apply. So if you're kind of, if any of those things kind of sparked your in interest just a little bit, again, it's all kind of web-based for us. The National Park Service positions are all alpha of usajobs.gov. Uh, and so you can go in with there, in there, set up a profile if you don't have one already, and you can search by location, job type, things like that. Uh, and then they just kind of come up. Sometimes they'll be available for, uh, for applying for 10 days. Sometimes it's two weeks. Sometimes it might be a little bit longer. Um, and then you can also actually within that, you can kind of hit if, if you can select it to like ping you with, with positions that come out, might be coming up um, within a certain, certain uh, criteria that you can tell it. Uh, and then the same thing with the SCA, uh, Student Conservation Association web, website. So I pulled here, uh, for example, the Raptor intern is up right now. So if you kind of search on SCA, and you're gonna, we can kind of get out into this if there's questions or details in, in the breakout sessions. But um, I think within that, you have to set up a profile within SCA, provide a little bit stuff like resume and, and maybe some references within that. And then you can go ahead and apply to specific positions that are open after you've kind of gone through that, through that step, that process. Um, I have some, some links here, uh, just kind of, again, with the websites uh, for SCA, NPS, like I mentioned, USA Jobs, the SCA, and then the ACE, the, the American Conservation Experience, which is an EPIC program for this particular position. So that is the emergence, Emerging Professionals in Conservation. Uh, and then I have my, my information here as well. If you want to get in contact with me about any questions about uh, resource management positions and where, where we're going with that and what we're going to be needing to fill next year, uh, as well as anything with SCA. Um, and I think we're going to have, in, the, in my breakout session anyway, um, my current uh, SCA intern, Brendan Flynn, will be around to answer any firsthand account questions if anybody has of a, of a current SCA uh, embedded here at Acadia. Uh, and then also specific questions if people have about navigating, kind of getting kind of your SCA profile together and then finding positions that are advertised all over the country, country there. So that is all I have right now. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, I did put a link in the chat. So the links that Jesse shared, we'll, we'll be adding all the links that the presenters share to that one single web page um, after today's session. So you'll have all the links um, in one place. And as positions become available, we'll, we'll be keeping that updated. Um, they all have different timelines and things. So um, if there's any quick clarifying questions, um, there was a question in the chat about the GS5 and what that means and levels, but I think that that question has been um, addressed. Um, but as we transition, Kate Petrie is next from the National Park Service in Acadia, and she's going to share some more education and learning related positions. And as Kate gets her slides up here, we can take um, there is a question, I'll take this one that's from the chat from Elise, um, a question about driver's licenses um, and whether or not those are required for all of these positions or does it vary? I can take that real quick. Um, for the, for the, most of the park service positions, it is a condition of employment. Um, at least I can know from, S, from the SCA, it's, it's not necessarily, however, what ends up beginning getting a little tough is that if people are, are coming here and they they need to have a, their own vehicle to get around 
Uh, so while I say it's not required everywhere, it's, it, is, it is often, at least for, for our park service positions. And there will be opportunities. Um, so we're going to have small groups. So you'll and you'll everyone will get to choose um, who they sort of are with in that breakout. So you'll have a lot of chance to ask specific questions of the presenters. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Kate, you ready? Can you see my slide? Yes. Great. Arrowhead with the National Park Service. Good. Good afternoon. I'm Kate Petrie. I'm the education coordinator for Acadia National Park. I work as part of the Visitor uh, Experience and Education Division, formerly known as Interp in Education for some of you. Uh, we work a combination or run a combination of visitor centers, nature centers, do public programs uh, with visitors, and also work with schools. Um, <clears throat> I posted in the chat a, a piece of advice about USA Jobs. Many of our jobs are hired through USA Jobs, and I'll get to that. But one thing to be aware of is a job will be open for one to two weeks. For example, I have a position coming up where I'm hiring five education technicians. Region will only accept so many applicants for five positions because they have to read every single resume and make sure it qualifies. So they'll set a, a limit of 50, 100, 200 applicants, depending upon how many people are being hired. They may post that job for a week, but if they get their 50 to 100 applicants on the first day, they will then close on that first day. They keep it open definitely for 24 hours, but not always for a week. So people on my staff who are looking for jobs on Monday check at midnight before they go to bed and check again like at 6 o'clock in the morning when they get up to make sure that they can get the job applications in. One way to help with doing that is to get on USA Jobs now, set up your account and upload your resume and be ready to hook it to uh, any job you want to apply for. A little bit about what, what we, we're offering and what we have in education. Um, Every year we hire a variety of seasonal ranger positions or education technicians, as well as uh, internships, fellowships, uh, and um, volunteer positions. People who work with me um, also work with uh, teacher professional development and are working in a broad range of stewardship experiences uh, and job opportunities. As I was talking about, paid ranger positions range from GS4s to GS7s uh, in interpretation. Uh, most of the fours and fives are entry level, first year experience. For 2022, our education technician positions have not been advertised, just like Jesse said. Their eyes are about to go out and become public. Some of our park ranger positions for the visitor center, however, advertise in October. So if you want to work at Acadia seasonally as a ranger, you need to get on year round and look for those application dates to show up. You can set up your account to tell you when they're advertised so that you can get into um, Parks. If you want to work in the park in May, you would have had to apply in October if you wanted to be a GS4 park guide. That is not true for every division. And there are three to six divisions in every park that you work with. So feel free to email me and ask questions. For Acadia, some of our jobs are still about to come out. So this is good timing. What do education rangers do? Uh, we work in a variety of fields. Uh, occasionally we work with cultural history and even dress uh, as a third person, third person interpreter. As you see the young man in the middle of the slide here doing cultural history demonstrations. We develop educational field trips uh, and work with family programming. These also assist with information desk operations, uh, write social media and work on other visitor services. 
I have a lot of paid internships that work with me. Um, we have four different seasons of internships within education. The spring education season, working with schools, K through eight. Summer season, working with the public. A fall season, working K through eight. And then a winter season, working with K-12 and virtual programming. Some of our interns, when they're working with the K-8 program, lead field trips. They start co-teaching and then work up to leading programs on their own. It's a good way to gain a lot of experience or arrange your job. Uh, others work with our residential education season, which is one of our longest internships uh, and probably gives you the, the broadest amount of training. As I stated before, interns work in every season of the year. Um, in addition to their um, leading programs, we work with each one to find out what they're interested in and try to give them behind the scenes job coaching um, and learning more about the Park Service. There's a lot of training that they get. Um, both the ranger and intern positions get a lot of training. Um, and mentoring and visitor services, education theory, techniques, uh, and resource content. We also have a lot of teacher professional development that are paid positions. We have the K to Teacher Fellows Program, uh, which is a six week internship in the park. Uh, and then we have outdoor classroom workshops for local teachers. That's one day a week in the park for four weeks. They learn about the conservation man, man, excuse me, management uh, and education programming that's available. They learn about the park behind the scenes. And then this paid position also works with researchers where they take information about current research and bring it back to the schools, making activities to help students learn about research in the park and outdoor classrooms. Our teacher fellows visit uh, a wide variety of locations in the park uh, and then work with interpreters in the field. And then volunteers, a great way to get experience again for a resume. We have a wide variety of volunteers in the park uh, from high school, uh, credit hours for different projects to alternative spring break. We really wouldn't open our doors without volunteers. Other volunteer opportunities um, work with our festivals, work with our education team. Uh, some work 32 hours a week uh, and, and work their way up to leading programs. I have uh, posted my contact information uh, for anybody who would like to email me and ask questions, uh, as well as two of our key uh, application sites, uh, usajobs.gov and volunteer.gov. And I'll also be available in breakout rooms uh, for questions. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I just had a, I had a quick question about um, can you repeat the volunteers? You mentioned the high school, you, there was alternative spring break and then there was something for high school before that? <clears throat> Local high schools require different numbers of credit hours, okay. uh, volunteering, and frequently those high school students will seek us out and work on a project that benefits us both. Might be creating a curriculum or activities, might be uh, yeah, the last uh, alternative spring break group we had here for college painted a 36 foot by 20 foot floor map for us to help us teach geography. So it, they really vary uh, in projects. Thank you. Um, all right, next Hannah Weber, Scudic Institute is going to talk about internships and technician positions at Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park. Hi, everybody. Um, I can't see any of you. So if someone could actually verbally tell me if you can see my screen and that you can hear me. Looks yep. good, Hannah. Looks good. Thank you. 
Love it. Um, first, I'm super psyched to be here today with all of you and with my um, fellow speakers who do represent a diversity of opportunities, which is just amazing when you think about it. So um, thanks to everybody who's here. And yeah, thank you all for coming out. Um, so I am going to talk about not just internships and technician positions, but also assistantships and fellowships at Skudik Institute. Um, as part of, of what it is that we all offer. So first, of course, um, I thought I should say, you know, what is this thing we're calling early career? And just to, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, if you're like, am I early career? Yes, you are. But um, so it is when, when someone, when one experiments through learning basic work skills um, that apply to a specific job or field, um, and the overall experience of working with others and collecting a paycheck and navigating workplace culture. Um, and I'm, I'm putting this up here to, to make the point that um, often early career, it is, it is in a transition time when either a high school person is, is trying to decide you know, what they're going to be doing next or when a college person is experimenting with, with a particular career path. Um, when somebody who's just leaving college or just post-college is trying to um, gain some basic work skills, applying the knowledge and skills that they already have and stretching a bit. Um, or for those who are farther along in their career, they're, they're trying to build and hone skills as well. So um, early career does sort of run a gamut, and it is really about, about experimenting with where we're going in our career through, through learning and through um, developing and honing work skills. So why Scudic? Um, so we've heard from the, the National Park Service. Everybody knows who that is. Um, of course, so Scudic Institute at Acadia National Park is a nonprofit partner to Acadia and the National Park Service with a mission of bringing together communities in science and learning for a changing world. So that's, that's a really killer mission and why not Scudic? Um, our early career folks who we bring on and have the good fortune to work with join a community that is observing and documenting and understanding our changing environment, while also um, engaging people in science and solutions. We have a diversity of opportunities that I'm gonna run through in the next several slides. High school assistantships, college internships, to technician positions, post-college internships, um, post-college fellowships, and then of course, graduate and postgraduate fellowships. For each of these, um, I will talk about sort of the season, the hours, the duration, a smattering of, of what the work is like, the trainings that um, are offered for each of these different levels or positions, some information about who you're working with, and then of course, eligibility. And then of course, if I'm not covering something, um, there's the breakout sessions, and I will tell you right now, there is a lot of text on the following slides. You have a, re you will have access to a recording of this, and you can always reach out to me um, afterwards if you want to go over anything that you might have missed on a slide. Again, there will be a lot of text on these next few slides. Um, so I wanted to start off, of course, with the high school assistantship. This is um, new for us and will be starting in January 2022. This is a four season position, five hours a week. This is not a full time job. This is for somebody who's in high school. Um, this person will be um, assisting the Goldsboro Shellfish Warden and other project partners with sort of the operation and maintenance of the Goldsboro Shellfish Resilience Lab. It will be working in clam aquaculture and also in the springtime seeding little baby, little small clams out into clam flats. Um, so it's, it's lab work slash um, aquaculture work, and then it's out in the field doing work. Uh, the co-workers, as I mentioned, are the Goldsboro Shellfish Warden, as well as other project partner partners, and of course, citizen scientists of, of all ages. Eligibility for this position, this is only available to um, a high school student who is local to the Scudic Peninsula. College internships. And I should mention there's, there's one assistantship position. For college internships, um, we take on um, two to three. We have taken on four, and that, that actually seems to work pretty well too. Um, in the January term for a college. So usually that's a three week 
internship. And then of course there are eight to 10 week internships in the summer. Um, again, two to three to four interns per either January or summer. These are full-time. We expect our interns to, to work just as technicians would in terms of, of how many hours they work. An intern will set up and run a, a mentored investigation. I say mentored because it's not as if it's just like, go have free reign. There is a, there is a, a broad umbrella question that we're trying to answer. And the interns really are in charge of setting up and figuring out how to answer that question uh, or contribute data to an answer for that question. They will lead their own data collection and analysis as well as communicating the work and they will lead others in the field in collecting data. Um, they may be leading other technicians or interns. They may also be leading citizen science efforts as well. They will assist others on their projects and will be contributing to any and all of the all hands on deck sort of field work when we need to send a large field crew out. Um, we, we do consider our interns to be part of that all hands. Um, some of the training that's offered, of course, we will train in field methods. Um, these, again, we're exploring. We don't expect our interns to come with extraordinary field skills. So we will train in field methods, wilderness first aid, science communication, and data analysis. Again, as I mentioned already, co-workers include other interns, technicians, citizen scientists, and of course you're mentored by um, Scudic Science staff. Eligibility, um, second, third, or fourth year college students with funding support from their college or university. The funding support has to cover stipend, housing, and food. Um, in an effort to make sure that we are attending to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we do not accept unfunded um, interns. So the technician positions, there are three foci for these. Um, we have field ecology technicians, forest health technicians, and wetland health technicians. Um, these are summertime full-time, and they are up to five months long. They have, each one of these has varying durations. Um, the technicians will work in varied field settings, whether it's the intertidal or deep in the forest or in the wetlands, and from mountaintops to the, well, not exactly to the deep blue sea, but to the deep blue bottom of the intertidal, which I guess is actually light blue. Um, we do expect the technicians to follow protocols. Sometimes they are developing these protocols, but largely following protocols to collect robust research quality data. Um, there is some data analysis, and of course, there is communicating the work. We expect them to take a leadership role in field work, especially with citizen scientists, but not exclusively. They may be leading their, their other technicians or interns and sometimes us. Um, it, they will assist others with projects, and again, they will also contribute to any and all, all hands on deck um, field work. Same training offered for these folks as for interns, field methods, wilderness first aid, science communication, data analysis. And they will be working with other technicians, citizen scientists, National Park Service resource management, and NETN staff. NETN is a part of the National Park Service the Northeast Temperate Network. Um, so they will be working with those staff, most especially the forest health and the wetland health technicians. We'll also be working with project partner staff and of course, Scutic Science staff. Um, eligibility is, um, you have to be a college graduate, a recent college graduate um, at that. So that's the college graduate, college graduate plus part. And housing is supplied for these positions. Um, I know that Chelsea is gonna talk about scientists and parks in a, in a couple of minutes. So I'm gonna go over this very quickly, but we do have post-college interns um, we are accepting scientists in parks, and that's um, the internship program through which we, we bring on these folks. Um, they are summertime, full-time, and 12 weeks. Our scientists in parks work on a specific project, the one that project, um, that is the scientist in park that's associated with SCUDIC. There are other opportunities. And that person is, those people are working on soft sediment biodiversity assessment, so mudflat biodiversity. Again, following protocols to collect the data, analysis, communication, and assisting when they have time available. They really are focused on a specific project, but when there's time available, they do also assist others with their projects. Same types of trainings offered, and the coworkers are also the same technicians, um, other interns, citizen scientists, resource management staff, 
project partner staff and of course Scudic Science staff. So you can see, I mean, I'm sort of saying the same coworkers over and over again, and we really do try to build this cohort of, of coworkers um, for people to be, be working all together within the field. The eligibility is to be a college graduate and housing is supplied. This is new for us this year and we're super duper excited about it. Um, these are the post-college fellowships and these are intentional uh, interdisciplinary fellowships integrating field data collection for research and monitoring with science education and engagement and science communication. So it's sort of this three-legged stool of interdisciplinarity. Um, the season for these folks, it sort of a shifted um, on the three-legged stool, there's a little shift. The education-focused fellowships are 10 months from August to May, whereas the research and monitoring as well as the science communication focus also have 10-month fellowships, but they run June to March. These are full-time. So we do expect these folks to integrate what they're learning in the field into learning settings and to integrate education aspects into what they're doing in the field and to be communicating about it all. Similar types of, of training, including curriculum development here as well, especially for the, the more education focused people. Um, the fellow cohort are coworkers as well as technicians, interns, citizen scientists, scudic science staff, National Park Service resource management and visitor experience and education staff. The eligibility here, again, cracking that, that space of, of recent college graduate. So college graduate plus college graduate with a few years out and housing is supplied for these positions. And finally, um, again, for these early career opportunities for, for people who have gone on in, a, in an academic pursuit, um, we have the second century stewardship fellows, which is for graduate and postgraduate um, people in that realm of their career. We have two to three awards per year of up to $20,000 per year. Um, there are specific goals that we're trying to meet with second century stewardship and the fellows are advancing those goals for us. Um, and these are about stewarding park resources, strengthening public understanding, engaging the public with science and addressing critical conservation challenges. These Fellowships are available for early career non-academic scientists, as well as assistant professors, postdoctoral researchers, graduate students. Um, you do need to be a US resident. And of course, like Kate, Jesse, and I can't apply for these because we are employed by the National Park Service for Scudic Institute, so we're not eligible. The application has closed for 2022, but the 2023 re request for proposals or RFPs will come out in late summer of 2022. Um, as Jesse had on his slide and, and um, Catherine put in the chat, all of these opportunities who do have, which do have um, sort of shifting or, or um, you know, variable application deadlines, you can find them on those jobs and internships at um, pardon me, in Acadia for early career scientists, you can find them on that link. We also at Scudic post all of our employment opportunities under the About Us and Employment Opportunities tab on our website. And you can contact me or Sarah Hooper if you have any other questions, comments, thoughts, considerations. And I will be happy to answer questions during the breakout sessions. So thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, next, we have Stephanie Clement from Friends of Acadia. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to um, try to share my screen here. There we go. And from the beginning. Here we go. So Friends of Acadia is one of the official partners to the National Park Service here at Acadia. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, with about almost 20 year round staff, but we equal that amount, if not more in seasonal employees every uh, summer and some positions extending into the fall. Our uh, mission statement here, you can see is a lot about stewardship of the Acadia National Park. So that's the focus of many of our positions is really working hand in hand with the National Park Service to uh, engage visitors and in protecting park resources. 
I'm just going to go through uh, a, a lot of our opportunities that are out there and uh, folks can ask questions in the breakout sessions. But as I mentioned, we have both summer and longer term seasonal positions into the fall. The application deadlines will vary. Uh, we have just started posting them this week to our website, and that will probably continue all the way through January. Some positions will be open until mid-February, so keep checking the Friends of Acadia website for uh, that information. Most of our seasonal jobs start at $17 an hour. Um, we bumped that up this year, again, in hopes of removing some of the barriers to anyone trying to come to the area uh, to take a job here because we don't offer housing um, for the most part through, um, so we need to try to bump up our salary in order to make it competitive in terms of finding housing here because that is a big challenge in the Acadia area. Much of the jobs also similarly, we provide uniforms um, for, so again, trying to remove barriers to employment here at Acadia. I just wanted to note that uh, vaccination for COVID may be required uh, for those who are working from park buildings and we will be sure to communicate that with uh, employees that we select in the end. The, these are our websites, uh, similar to what Hannah just said. Um, we have an About Us Employment Opportunities webpage that is specific to uh, the Friends of Acadia jobs, but there's also uh, the Scudic Institute website that has, um, they have graciously combined all of these opportunities together. And again, as a Friends of Acadia employee, um, you're employed by our organization, but your time is granted to the park. So you are, in fact, a park volunteer, um, which is, uh, it's really exciting to, when you think about you, so many opportunities working in Acadia National Park, not all are in the green and gray uniform. So uh, parks are really exciting places to work. So I encourage all of you to, to um, think about it. And also on your application for the Friends of Acadia applications, we do encourage you to pay specific attention to the application information. And the biggest tip I always give is please use your cover letter to connect your resume to why you're qualified for the job. Um, that is the real linking opportunity where you can say um, and explain, okay, this is who I am, which you'll see in my resume, and this is why I'm qualified for the job application. So the first job that we have is the summit stewards and uh, these folks hike through the park and inform visitors about leave no trace and other topics. They can be found quite often on the Cadillac Mountain Summit where they help sometimes with traffic management and also answer visitor questions. They may perform light trail maintenance um, like uh, destroying visitor built cairns or um, uh, fixing the cairns that the National Park Service would like to see out there on the trails. Sometimes they do participate in search and rescue and they, um, they try to help the Park Service by logging daily activities and observations and giving tips and hints for management. Um, the next one is the Acadia Digital Media Team. These are folks who are out taking photos in the park of park programs, of Friends of Acadia programs, and also trying to highlight through video and photographs proper visitor behaviors. For instance, um, here's what it's like to ride the Island Explorer, or here's how to um, behave properly on the trails in the winter. Um, here are leave no trace uh, tips and so on. They also um, assist Friends of Acadia with live streaming some of our events. And next year, there's gonna be a real focus on taking some of the videos that they do and, and making sure they're accessible and usable by the National Park Service with captioning and uh, interpretation. They also help out at, with video interpretation at the Peregrine Falcon program. We also have a social media specialist that we're looking for that would be part of the Acadia digital media team. And this person would work most closely with Friends of Acadia on our social media campaigns and responding to um, visitor comments on various platforms. They'll also work on organizing our photo library, live streaming events and helping again at the Peregrine Falcon site. On a more broad basis, we'll have a communications intern. We're currently searching for this person right now. And this person would help Friends of Acadia with more of a broad look at communications. How do we use the Friends of Acadia or the Acadia Journal? How do we use our website? How do we use our social media? How do we use press releases and so on to um, kind of try to increase outreach 
beyond the choir to uh, encourage, uh, I guess, resource sensitive visitation to the area, to inform people about climate change, to um, try to really um, attract people into the things that we care about here in the park. This person would report directly to the communications director at Friends of Acadia and her email address is there. I looked today and that application is up on our website. You can do this internship remotely. Um, so please do take a look if you're interested in working over the spring semester. Um, before I go on to the wild gardens, I wanted to mention another particular internship that is a winter internship. And that is you'd be working directly with the National Park Service. Um, there's a, a Women in Acadia internship that we'll be posting to our website here shortly, but that person will be working over next spring with a possibility of housing uh, to um, really highlight uh, all of the accomplishments of women working in Acadia and the contributions that women have made to the founding of Acadia to people like Kate Petrie who are working for the National Park Service now. So um, that one will be up on our website soon. Um, Moving on to the Wild Gardens of Acadia intern, uh, this person works at Sertima Springs. Sorry, my cat is joining our, our, our conversation here. Um, and they help maintain the gardens, weeding, watering, uh, working with volunteers. But a big part of the job is trying to get visitors to the Wild Gardens excited about native plants and why they're important to the park. The Wild Gardens have a number of habitats that are maintained by the volunteers that display um, native plants to Acadia. So this person may assist with educational materials, as well as doing the basic maintenance tasks in the gardens. The recreation technicians have a really exciting job, I think, in the park. They work with resource management staff to track visitor use in the park, whether that's through traffic counts, like what you see here happening, or whether it's um, organizing volunteers to take counts on the carriage roads of numbers of people, numbers of horses, numbers of dogs, numbers of e-bikes, numbers of bikes, and they help collect all the data, process it, um, and it's used by the park in their st st statistical analyses. So it's um, an exciting opportunity. We'll have one long-term position next year and one shorter one as well. The stewardship assistant is another job that's available. Um, we, again, one long-term and one shorter term, most likely. They work with the volunteer crew leaders and the trails and the carriage roads program to facilitate anyone dropping in to actually help contribute to the stewardship of the trails and carriage roads. So um, what is helpful for this job is familiarity with um, some trail maintenance techniques uh, and outdoor education. Um, you may be sharpening tools one day and the next day you may be helping volunteers build bog bridging. Um, and there's also a lot of documentation and reporting that happens as part of this job as well. And finally, this is our high school opportunity that Friends of Acadia and Acadia National Park um, partner on, and it's called the Acadia Youth Conservation Corps. That's open to people who have not yet um, turned 19. Um, and you work with the park on mostly on trails and carriage roads opportunities, but we're also hoping to expand it into other divisions of the park as well next year. So stay tuned on that one. Friends of Acadia doesn't hire this one that's run through the park directly. Um, so, but we will help with advertising and so on. So if you are a high school student and interested in um, the Youth Conservation Corps opportunity, please do stay posted for that. So again, uh, those are the two websites and we'll talk about that uh, later on and in the breakout sessions. So thank you very much and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Stephanie. I feel like those TV ads, but wait, there's more. Uh, so in case you're overwhelmed, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, one more presentation and then we're going to go um, to breakouts. Um, and so Chelsea Fitting is going to talk about scientists and parks. Welcome, Chelsea. So glad you could join us. Hi, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Tulsi Bidding, and I'm the partnership lead for the Scientists and Parks program. Uh, I think I'm probably the only one on the call today who's not from the East Coast. I'm actually based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, but this program that I help oversee um, is utilized all over 
the US and in all sorts of national parks, including Acadia. So that's uh, why I'm here today to talk to you guys. So the SIP program, oh, sorry, uh, the SIP program um, really is a win-win for both parks and for interns. Um, parks come to us with technical assistance uh, requests that they have that they feel can be met by interns. And so in turn, um, our program participants get this really great opportunity for mentoring, learning, training um, about the ins and outs of the National Park Service. We really, really hope that they have a good connection with um, national parks and kind of form that lifelong connection. And really our end goal is to hopefully then hire some of these folks on as NPS employees and to work with them in the field and, and in offices um, all over our parks. So a little bit about our program. So it's pretty large. I think we are the largest or at least one of the largest internship programs, at least for science in the National Park Service. We have 200 interns a year at least. Uh, they, come, they work all throughout the year, summer, winter, um, varying start dates. I know specifically for um, this webinar, we're really mainly talking about summer 2022. We've got a lot of positions um, starting in the summer. And then the big thing about the Scientists and Parks program is we are really focused on natural resource science management and disciplines. And so all of our projects fall within the category of biological, physical, social sciences, or also very important, the communication of science and education. Um, so most projects then fall within the realm of air quality, lots and lots, um, at least have some sort of tie to climate change, ecology, geology, hydrology, natural sounds, night skies, paleontology, cave and karst, plants, uh, invasive plant management. We've just um, have a whole wide variety of disciplines that we cover all within the natural resource management disciplines. And then, as I said earlier, our internships are available in national parks all across the US, not just Acadia, although we do have three positions that will be open in summer 2022 um, in Acadia. But I think total, we are hiring for 154, um, at least, I think, this upcoming summer. So um, if you may be close to Katie now, but if you're thinking that you want to go somewhere else, look into it. We have positions in Guam, Alaska, uh, Virgin Islands, Florida, Colorado, anywhere and everywhere we've got positions. So with that, I just want to go over, we have three position types. So the Acadia internships I mentioned earlier, all three of those fall within an SIP intern. That's the first position type. These are for entry and mid-level skill sets. So that would be someone who is um, maybe a sophomore, junior in college, or that we have a lot of folks that have already graduated and this is kind of their first you know, foray into um, working in a National Park Service. Uh, these positions occur in summer and winter season. We have 12, 20, 26, 36, or 52 week positions. So that's what I was saying. Sometimes people will fully graduate college because it's can't really work full time and, and go to school at the same time. So a lot of folks have also already graduated. Uh, we have no academic requirement for SIP interns. And then you're also potentially eligible for a hiring authority. I'm not really gonna go into those, but if you have more questions about them, we can talk about it in um, the breakout groups. Uh, so these are SIP interns. A vast majority of our positions fall within this category um, of SIP intern. Our next one is SIP fellows. These are really more for advanced skill sets. So junior or senior in college or graduate students. Most of our folks are graduate students. We had several folks getting their PhD last year. These are very rigorous um, internships in the summer for 12 weeks. You must be a student. You must be enrolled in school. Um, and with successful completion of your SIP fellow, you'll be eligible for direct hire authority. 
And so we have, just to give you an idea of numbers, so we have about 15, we don't have about, we have 15 fellow physicians for this upcoming summer. Uh, sorry, numbers are finalized. Um, so I can say that we have 15. And then for SIP Mosaics, these projects um, kind of run the gamut from entry level to advanced skill sets. They're meant for racially and ethnically diverse folks. And we have 24 positions this upcoming summer. They last either, I say it's 11 or 19 weeks plus a career workshop. So technically 12 or 20 weeks are these positions. Um, and then you are potentially eligible as well for some of these hiring authorities. So these are three position types. Um, there's a different application process for all three of them. So I'll give you the link to just the SIP page as a whole. And from there, you can get to any of the applications for these three types of positions. So some of the benefits um, for uh, having an internship with SIP, I just, before I go into this, I just wanna say that each position type has different benefits. So I've kind of put it in here, but some of them you're gonna to have to really read what the benef specific benefits are for each position type. But every single position is paid. Um, they run the range of uh, $400 a week to $640 a week, just depending on the type of position. Each one is potentially eligible for a hiring authority with successful completion of your internship. And one of the big key components is you, you just have this great mentorship opportunity to work with MPS employee, employees and get that real world experience of being in there, um, working with them, learning kind of how all of it works. And then hopefully some good networking opportunities to meet other folks within the MPS. We're always really recommending uh, that supervisors, mentors help their intern reach out to other folks with similar interests so they aren't just talking to people from that park. SIP interns. Uh, will receive an AmeriCorps Education Award. So that's the first of the three um, position, position types. That was the first one I discussed was SIP interns. They receive an AmeriCorps Education Award. And then Mosaics, I kind of mentioned this, attend a week-long career workshop at the end where they actually get to go to DC and meet a whole bunch of very high-level folks um, in Washington. So it's a great experience. I just quickly want to go over some of the basics, eligibility, you must be a US citizen or permanent legal resident. Uh, these positions are hired through our partners and all of our partners um, have said that COVID vaccination will be required from here on out. And then just another little plug that eligibility is very dependent on the position to which you are applying. So as Hannah said earlier, she for the, her SIP positions is really looking for someone who has completed their college degree. So parks can come and give their own um, eligibility or qualifications. Um, and then certain positions uh, like the fellows where you get DHA, you must be a student. So just carefully read um, the requirements for each uh, project. Nope. Um, and then a lot of what you guys are hearing today, the positions are not open, the applications are not open. Ours are open. So the um, link that's been shared with you, you can go there. And from there is a good, really good launching off point to get to the applications. They are all three um, within different websites. So just be aware of that. But the deadline's January 23rd. Applications are open. They cap at 100 applications per position. So I highly recommend looking sooner rather than later. They just opened December 3rd. So none of them should be full yet at all. Um, but that's just, just a quick plug um, that they're open and we're excited to see you guys apply. And then the yeah, public website. And then if you guys have any questions, you can find us on the website as well. This is just our program email. Just reach out to us. Thanks. Thanks, Chelsea. Can you just quickly, so we're, we're gonna, um, you're gonna get an option on the screen to choose um, your your breakout group. And Emma, I think you're gonna share that, the breakout group room assignments. Is that a slide with that? Um, so, so while you're thinking about which group you're going to join, um, just a quick question, Chelsea. Um, can you just explain like quickly what federal hiring authority means in that little 
Oh gosh. <laughs> a federal hiring authority is basically when you go through USA jobs. So all federal um, positions you must apply for using USA jobs and hiring authorities kind of help give you that leg up. So if there are like a hundred applicants, um, you know, and if they meet, if they're eligible, if they meet the qualifications, and if you meet the qualifications as well, if you have that hiring authority, it kind of puts you in line above them. So it just kind of helps you bump, helps to bump you up on the list of eligible applicants. Was that clear enough? Yeah, I, I think okay. so. That's helpful. Um, so just a reminder, we're going to have two breakout rooms. So yeah, first, you know, you'll have two chances. Um, so you'll be able to select and the breakout group room numbers will be the same. Um, so you'll have seven minutes in, in the first breakout and then we're just going to quickly shift immediately to the second breakout, and then we'll have time to just come back together quickly at the end in case there were any points of discussion or clarifications that people wanted to share with the whole group. Um, so I think we are ready to go to breakouts um, and have your questions ready. Didn't get to answer the last question. <clears throat> we're we're going to do it again. Um, and then if there is a final question, Hannah, when we come back, um, you can you can raise it. So <laughs> well, thanks so much, everybody. I hope that that was helpful. Um, I'm just going to go through and ask um, each of our speakers, if they have any um, final points or clarifying um, that they want to make just in our last five minutes. Again, I really appreciate everybody um, joining us. We will keep that web page updated. I'm going to update it um, before the weekend with all the, the active links for the positions that are open now and then um, just check back in January. And if you lose that link, just go to the news section of Scudic's website. I'll I'll keep it front and center so it's easy to find. Um, but I wonder, um, Jesse, if you have any anything to share or clarify. Sure, just uh, I guess that one thing I didn't mention at the beginning, all of the uh, Park Service positions, as well as uh, the SCA positions that I believe I talked about pro do provide housing. They're usually in government housing. Um, uh, the, the SCA positions, it's, it's paid, so that's free. But if you're an employee of the park, then then you pay um, for, for the housing, but at least it is kind of provided there. Uh, and then something I did mention in our breakouts, but not in the whole thing, is that we are the SEA positions as well as the ACE position is AmeriCorps eligible uh, as well. Um, and yeah, I think that that's it for for now, unless there's specific other more questions. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, Kate, any any final points? Um, a lot of the positions come with housing, but not all of them. So ask when you're interviewing. Um, and, and I just can't stress enough is to get on usajobs.gov and become familiar with it. Create your account and upload your, upload your resume now. You can always tailor a cover letter in a half an hour, but not the whole resume. Put everything that represents your skills in a resume. When you're applying to the government, the old adage of a one-page resume does not follow through. It could be five or six or ten if it needs to be. Um, but get all your skills listed in there because that's what the people grading resumes and making sure that they qualify are looking for. Get all the good buzz words in there that you've led programs, you've written curriculum, because every one of those will help you. Thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> um, Hannah. Yeah, thanks again, everybody, for coming out um, this afternoon. And, you know, uh, I want to say that we look forward every year to when our early career folks get to campus and start working with us because they bring this extraordinary energy of, of newness and excitement. They ask the best questions. And sometimes when you're just like old and crotchety, you forget why or how or what you're doing. And so it's, it's 
absolutely wonderful to be working with early career people because they really sort of they they bring us up to where the level of our game always has to be and it's just wonderful to work for them so you any of the positions or jobs or opportunities that you heard about today as an early career person you're going to meet the same folks who are going to be super stoked to work with you because it just is is exciting and wonderful to work with people at all levels of their career development and so apply to any of these and it, i look forward to working with you as i think we all do Thanks, Hannah. Stephanie. Yeah, I just will say again, parks are some of the coolest places to work. So I do anything you can to get here. Um, and then the other thing I would just say, contrary to what Kate just told you, if you're applying to a Friends of Acadia job, please do try to drill your information down tighter. And <laughs> but I think um, the the again, the biggest tip I had is uh, there is, there's lots of experience that has shaped who you are. And I don't wanna hear in your cover letter why you love Acadia and how, how your family came and visited every summer or you know that kind of thing. I wanna hear about um, you as a human, uh, what experience have you had in your life that might make you prepared for the job ahead and uh, the skills that are needed. And we just had a little conversation about that in our last session about, um, even if we're looking for a communications person, tell us about uh, you know what social media platforms you're on. Tell us about um, what you think is most effective in Friends of Acadia's programs, or you know, um, and if you're applying to deal with the public in one of our jobs, tell us about have you ever been a volunteer before and and had to approach someone or talk to someone at a front desk or whatever the opportunity might be. So. That, that's all, just match your cover letter to tell us about your experience. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Chelsea, again, really appreciate, Chelsea, you joining um, joining us and sharing opportunities with scientists and parks, not just in Acadia, but a, a, across the national park system. Yeah, uh, and I, I just wanna piggyback kind of off of the several folks earlier, something that I see in applicants that they put, I kind of mentioned this in mine as well, is. A lot of folks put their most recent experience, which may have absolutely nothing to do with the relevant experience that they need for this position. It was their last paid experience. And so they put that, I saw that a lot last year and put your most, your, your relevant experience top. I don't care if it was several years ago, put it at the top. Like when we see your resume, the first thing I wanna see is how are you eligible and how do you qualify for this? Um, and yeah, for our program for scientists and parks, you don't need to make it a one page resume. You can, you can make a little bit longer, elaborate a little bit, really show how you um, meet the requirements and the qualifications for the position, um, even if it's volunteer experience. Volunteer experience counts, people forget that. So I like to remind them that just because you weren't paid for it does not mean it doesn't count as relevant experience. And so please include that. Um, in your resume. And yeah, one last plug, our applications are open now until January 23rd. Um, so please apply, 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 and apply early. That's all. Thank you. And I'm just gonna have um, Nick Fizzichelli just um, say a last word and um, thanks everybody for joining us. Yeah, big thank you everyone for, for joining today. And, and I think you've gotten some good tips and, and, and ideas for, for putting together a really competitive uh, application. We, we, need, we need the best and the brightest to be working in conservation fields for the future. Uh, often right out of college is kind of that, it's that eye of the needle where it can be challenging to find uh, opportunities, but there, there are opportunities as you've heard about today, all kinds of opportunities. And you always hear crazy statistics about you know, the number of baby boomers that are retiring every, was it like three every minute or something crazy like that. So there are going to be opportunities in the future. And, and I think conservation fields are a great place to be. So thanks all for your interest. And thanks to all the partners on here today uh, that make this work happen, National Park Service and Friends of Acadia and Scudic Institute. So thanks all and, and check out the links that Catherine 
supplied, and we'll have more info on, on each of our websites. All right, have a wonderful evening, and hopefully everybody gets some more snow soon. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you for coming.